In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at three new motherboards released from ASRock for the Z790 refresh. And with these refresh lineup of boards, you get native support for 14th gen from the get-go. So you won't have any confusion with having to update a BIOS. And also we will go through these motherboards one by one so you can just skip to the section if you want to see how that motherboard performs and then we'll move on to a conclusion with these three boards because in my opinion they all have something to offer though before we get into any board in particular all three of these boards have a clip on m.2 pcie gen 5 slot at the top and this heatsink works really good and the Gen 5 SSD speeds are there. We tested this out with a one terabyte Gen 5 drive and the speeds were good across all three boards. And all these boards feature 2.5 gigabit ethernet connections and RGB headers for 12 volt analog as well as five volt addressable RGB, which you can control in the BIOS through the polychrome RGB firmware, which doesn't require any software or bloatware in your windows which is one reason why I really like ASRock boards if you are into RGB. Though we will start with my favorite of the bunch here, and that is of course the best value in my opinion, the cheapest board, the Lightning Wi-Fi, where over the previous non-Wi-Fi version, which was released early in the year, it does come in $40 cheaper. I think you can get the non-Wi-Fi for $160, but for that extra $40, you don't just get Wi-Fi 6, you also get an eight layer PCB as well as an extra two phases on the VRM. And here's where I'm gonna be testing out today with all these three boards, the i9-14900K, as well as doing various other augmented tests, like testing out how good the onboard audio is with headphones, so you can see how much value you're extracting, not just from getting your pure purchase with a CPU and dropping it in, but also other things as well. And here's where for the VRM side, here's where we put an IR camera on this VRM after stress testing in Cinebench R23 on a loop. Though for this board, they've got two power limits in place. They've got a PL1, which is 250 watts. And then they've got PL2, which is 320 watts. So what this means is for the benchmarks here and the temperatures, the wattage will actually drop down after 56 seconds to that lower power state. And so the temperatures you see here will actually differ from the Nova, which has different power limits. And we'll get onto that testing later. But what we saw here was at 252 watts, you're getting extremely low temperatures, even in a 25 degrees Celsius environment on the actual board and MOSFETs itself. And then it records 38 degrees on the heat sink. And this is actually incredible performance for a $200 board with an i9-14900K. So if you look at these results, you already know what's installed for the other two boards. And the VRM here is just phenomenal for the money. Now, in terms of memory speeds, they advertise up to 7,600 megahertz on their website. I actually managed to get 7,800 megahertz working on this board. And then for the speeds on the CPU itself, because of the power limit too, it will drop anywhere from 5.2 gigahertz all core to 5.6 gigahertz. However, of course, you can change these power limits in the BIOS easily if you want to go to higher power consumption. I personally just think the i9-14900K, even after 200 watts, has extremely high diminishing returns where you're not getting a whole lot for that extra power consumption. Though we will be talking about that in a upcoming review of the i9-14900K very soon. I'll put the link up here when that's ready. But with this board, we'll also go through the onboard audio here, where it features the Realtek ALC897 Kodak, as well as what they call Nehemic audio with separate layers of PCB separating the audio channels. And here is where I actually saw phenomenal results out of this onboard audio doing my tests here with a two to 10 Hertz roll off of minus 1.2 decibels. And then on the high end, it was roughly 0.1 decibel roll off after 10K. And the distortion figures were very well controlled. And then the crosstalk showing you had roughly minus 85 decibels of separation. So really solid results coming in for the onboard audio. You can use this with mid-range cans and get an extremely good listening experience as well as using the onboard audio even via analog to power another speaker set that's amped and you'll actually get a really good listening experience that way too. Now in terms of stability, we tested out the USB ports. They were working absolutely fine, no dropouts. Speeds were terrific. 
we tested out the Gen 5 drive in the top slot and that was working really well too in terms of its speeds. Then now we're gonna move on to the Z790 Riptide Wi-Fi, which comes in at $250. So it's an extra $50 versus the Lightning Wi-Fi and it's also $60 over its non-Wi-Fi counterpart. But for that extra money, you do get uh, M.2 heat sinks down covering all the rest of the M.2 slots versus the top slot. And you get also two extra SATA ports. You get an extra USB port at the rear as well as a display port out. And you get the lightning game ports which feature a separate USB controller for those two ports on their own as well as 20k capacitors on the same 18 phase VRM. Now I do believe they've used the a USB 3 front out connector where you get two of those on the Lightning versus the single on the Riptide to put that and reroute it to the rear to get your Lightning game ports. But in terms of the extra feature set, is that extra $50 worth it? Well, if you're looking for just pure performance, my answer here is no, where it performed very similar in the Cinebench scores. The VRM temperature results were almost identical and the onboard audio also features the Realtek ALC897 which performed almost identical to the Lightning. So you're looking at here, do you need that extra feature set that we just described? And this has got Wi-Fi 7, which is even faster. Though for me personally, I would just save $50 and go for the Lightning if I was to get a new Z790 motherboard where I only use a single M.2 drive in even my workstations and it's never let me down. So extra 50 bucks if you want it there. Of course, the 20K capacitors, if you're thinking, well, Brian, is those 20K capacitors going to make up a difference in the long run? And my answer to this is, like any CPU I get nowadays, I usually tune them for efficiency. In the case of the i9-14900K, I would be getting a tune of around 200 watts. So 195 watts is what I like to stay at with that CPU. And that's gonna make the VRM temperatures just so low that the differences between the capacitors on the Lightning and the Riptide are just not going to make a difference in terms of longevity. Because the, these, these capacitors, when they have the 5K and the 20K ratings, this is at 105 degrees Celsius for 5,000 hours and for 20,000 hours. That's extremely durable products at these ratings. And that's usually, even then, that's just a blanket recommendation. They can last a lot longer than that too. So. Bottom line is here is if you take care of the lightning board, it's gonna last a long time, even without the 20K capacitors. Anyhow, with all that aside, it's now time to move on to another one of my favorites, and this is the Z790 Nova, where it's coming in at $280, which may seem expensive, but I think of this board as literally a flagship board. You've got a now 22 phase VRM, 20 plus one plus one, You've got those 20K capacitors. You've also got an eight layer PCB here. You've got audio as well, which features the Realtek ALC4082. Now this was the best audio in the testing I did here today. Had minus 87 decibel crosstalk. It also had a slightly less distortion and also slightly lower roll off, both on the lower end and the higher end. But in the real world, it's really not going to make a whole lot of a difference. This is just that board for someone who wants that elite performance. Now we did manage to squeeze out 8,000 megahertz on this board in terms of its DDR5 overclocks. And also the performance was very similar to the other two boards when it came to the power limits of 252 watts and also the power limit of 320 watts. But here's the biggest difference with the Nova I tested this out of the box and it just has no power limit on it at all. The power limits are uncapped. And so this is going to give you sustained higher performance after say 20 minutes of even testing Cinebench R23. And so this kind of power consumption can go up to 340 watts with the i9-4900K when I was testing this. And this is pretty much ridiculous. I would not use this CPU at these wattage settings, but this board can comfortably support that where what we saw here was even at these higher wattage numbers, we saw a 61 degree surface temperature and 39 degrees in a 25C ambient environment on the heat sink. Now, probably thinking, why is the heat sink so cool and why are the VRM so cool? This actually employs a uh, active heat sink solution on its VRM, 
where you've got a little fan there that uh, cools things down. It's actually inaudible. It's really uh, quiet as well. So they've done a great job in implementing that. And of course, that's just going to keep your temperatures lower on your VRM. If you want to push it even past 340 watts, this thing is going to do it. But one thing I'm going to say now is in terms of the efficiency of the VRM on all three of these motherboards, they're all very similar. So in other words, you're getting a good VRM for a 14900K on air or water from all three. For instance, in the past, I have tested motherboards where out of the box, they're fine with the CPU. But once you start to go to higher power consumption levels, the VRM just starts to lose the efficiency very quickly. I do remember this. I think it was from like a B550 motherboard from MSI from the top of my head, though these boards don't exhibit any of that. And the efficiency, of course, the Nova, just like the Lightning and the Riptide, is really good. Also, other reasons I really like this board in particular is you've got the power and reset buttons down the bottom, perfect for a test setup or if you don't want to use a case. And you've got a BIOS LED readout code on the top, as well as the clear CMOS button on the back. And speaking of the back, you've got also an additional two USB ports versus the other two making a total of 10 USB ports. All three have Thunderbolt support, by the way, and you've got your Wi-Fi 7. And one of my favorite things about this board is you've got that optical Toslink support there with its own separate connector. Now, for example, like Brian Toslink is old, it's dated, but I mean, I still use it. I love getting good deals on older audio hardware that uses this digital standard from I think it was the 1980s, but it still just plays really good 2.1 sound and the other two boards don't support this. So for me personally, this Toslink connector is actually very important on my main workstation. So that's also another differing factor on the Nova. Though this now rolls us into a conclusion, but we'll also talk about the BIOS on all three, which was very similar. They just had a slightly different uh, aesthetic on that BIOS. And in the ASRock BIOS, it's very simple. They've actually even updated it from previous generations where you now get a little bit more detail on the right-hand side. So they've enhanced the BIOS just that little bit better. And there's really nothing they need to change here. You've got all the settings laid out in the proper tabs up the top. You can change fan speeds. You can update your BIOS very easily. You can quickly disable or enable security features that are very annoying and are forced to be on for Windows 11. For me personally, I use Windows 10 in a lot of my testing and just disable all these security features. And it's very easy to find them in the BIOSes on ASRock, as well as having 10 different overclock profiles to save from and all the overclocking settings you'll need with ease of access to them. In terms of the memory as well, you've also got the option to auto-tune memory overclocks with their BIOSes, which does a great job, especially if you're coming into some kinds of issues, getting memory stability to work properly. So all that aside though, BIOS is great. All three of these boards actually surprised me. So I'm gonna be putting my hands on two of these motherboards, which are my favorites in today's video. The Riptide's sitting in the middle, which doesn't really have much of a differentiating factor to make it more attractive over the other two, especially for the money. At its current price point of 280 US dollars, the Nova, in my opinion, is a flagship board coming in with not really a flagship price. I really like what ASRock are doing here with this particular series. I want to see more from it, especially having also a gorgeous aesthetic. And on top of all that, I forgot to mention it does have a backplate on the motherboard too, if you like more rigidity with your motherboards. Now, the Lightning, this is the $200 option, which still features the eight layer PCB, a 18 phase VRM, which is incredibly potent. And you've still got the Wi-Fi 6 on board. You've got the PCI Gen 5. So this board just, offers all the features the other two boards do. And if you're worried about power limits, you can unlock them in the BIOS and this VRM will still be able to handle easily 300 plus watts. Then for the DDR5 tuning, I had no problems getting 7,800 megahertz. However, if you wanna go for 8,000 megahertz, you might wanna go for the Nova here. But again, memory tuning DDR5, if you want to spend a lot of time with it, just be aware that you may not get your returns from tuning that memory where you may think everything's stable for a few days and then you get this random blue screen and then you're thinking, we're gonna go back to tuning our memory again. So I only ever tune my memory 
and I go in depth for it for my main rigs. And even then I still find a stable tune and actually just drop it ever so slightly so I don't come into any crashes. Anyhow guys, out of these three motherboards, two of them are clear winners. The Riptide, as we said before, it's kind of hard to differentiate itself from the other two where I would just pay that little bit extra and get the Nova if you want the feature set the Riptide has. And then if you want to save money, you're going to be saving 50 bucks and the Lightning is going to give you a very similar experience to the Riptide. So this board kind of sits in the middle, but the Lightning, extremely good value if you want to get into even high-end Z790 CPUs like the i9-14900K. Then the Nova that's offering a like flagship-like performance for not so much a flagship price. Anyhow, hope you enjoyed today's review of the motherboards. Even though these motherboards are getting pretty good reviews here today, the CPUs will be something different. So do stay tuned for that. I will release that in the next few days. If you want to see that the moment it drops, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell. Also, if you have any questions or comments about today's review and the testing, be sure to drop a comment down below. And also the last question I'll ask you guys is which would you pick out of the bunch where I really want to see more of the Lightning series. Hopefully this can really make a bang on the AMD side of the fence too. I think this formula here is a winner. Anyhow, we got the question of the day here. And this comes from System Modman 2157 This is the question for the next video. In my country, GPU, CPU motherboards are overpriced. And in AliExpress, there are good deals. But should I buy SSDs and RAM from AliExpress or not? Since SSDs and RAM in my country are kind of good, should I buy locally or not? Thank you. And the answer is, if prices of SSDs and RAM are similar locally where you are to AliExpress, I would just buy locally. You've got that warranty there. You've got the guarantee. But if the price is a lot different, then AliExpress does have really good deals on SSD and RAM. I've actually bought a lot of SSDs of AliExpress before. Never had a problem, but that being said, I have had one time where I got scammed because they sold me a fake drive. I'll put the link to the video up here, but I actually ended up getting my money back on that. So yeah, anyhow, if the prices are very similar, go local. If the prices are different, AliExpress does have really good deals on SSD and RAM. Hope that answers that question. I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. Then with all that aside, it's now time for a conclusion here where I'm gonna put my hand on two of the boards and this is why they're standing up versus... <clears throat> we'll just pretend that never happened. Thank you.